All right, let's do it. Listos? Listos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, look at this. Well, oh, there's Salvadorans in here, man. I wanted to cancel this right now. Those people are very uh -huh. problematic. I see some names I recognize. So beautiful faces, man. Yeah, Salvadorans, though, they're 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 problematic people. They're very political. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna delete some of them if that's okay. I can't. Oh come on. Well, let's let, let let's get this show on the road. Buenas noches, mi gente. Look at all these beautiful brown faces and names. Híjole. Uh, everyone, 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 welcome to uh, City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of City Lights bookstores in-store calendar during this pinche pandemico that we're all a part of. Uh, though we are unable to hold events at the store, we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with online readings, discussions, and forums throughout the month of uh, August, September, October, November, and December. And uh, uh, just want to give you all a quick update on City Lights before we get this uh, shindig pachanga on the road. We're just really happy here uh, at City Lights to say that we've uh, finally reopened the store. It's been open for a couple months to the public. We're following strict uh, health department guidelines. So um, no worries if you feel like coming in and seeing us because let's be honest, the bookstore has missed you. We have missed you. Bookstores are therapy, y'all, so come on in, get some good therapy, buy some books from us. I know it's been a while since we've seen y'all, so come on in. We're 12 to 8, siete días a la semana, 12 to 8, so come on in. City Lights misses y'all, no doubt, no doubt. Um, and for those of you that don't know, not only is City Lights Books a publishing uh, a bookstore, but we're also a publishing house, and we've been one since the very beginning. Uh, I'm proud to say that this year we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the great City Lights Spotlight Poetry Series, uh, following in the grand tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti's Pocket Poet Series. So we're proud to be uh, publishing, even in this pandemic of time, City Lights is still grinding, man, and still putting books out. So uh, really excited about uh, Uchi Naduka's book, as well as Sofia Dalin and Ijole, y'all. This came up last week. The one and only Juan Felipe Pereira's new book of poesia is out. Every day we get more legal. So tap in with the bookstore, pick up some copies of those for sure. To learn more about our books and what we're offering, go to City Lights uh, page, www.citylights.com. You can also visit us. We're all over that pinche social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. So now that we got the details out of the way, let me just say that Man, City Lights is over La Luna excited to be welcoming tonight the one and only, we like to call him the San Francisco freak, not treat y'all, freak. It's Roberto Lovato and his uh, very, very special guest, OG Chingona Maestra Miriam Gerba. Tonight in our Zoom Mundo, they're going to be discussing Roberto's amazing new memoir, I'm Forgetting. And honestly, y'all, to call this book a memoir is almost a uh, limiting it in its scope because there's so much in the paginas of this libro, man. Uh, the memoirs there, the San Pancho Historias there, the Central American histories there. It's a really important book. So we are over La Luna excited tonight to have this for sure. And uh, I'm sure y'all want to ask Roberto a lot of questions as well as Miriam. So don't worry at the end of the uh, discussion, we're going to be having a Q and A. So if you have any preguntas, any questions you want to ask Roberto or uh, Miriam, Go ahead and post your preguntas in the chat and uh, we'll be reading them back to them at the end of the evening, okay? So um, also I wanna say, if you haven't purchased this book yet, what's wrong with you, man? We're gonna be <laughs> posting the links to purchase Roberto's amazing libro. So please y'all uh, support Central American Escritores, man. Support City Lights Books, support Latinx literature and uh, buy this amazing book and uh, while you're at it, check out City Lights uh, uh, inventory. Buy some books, buy some books, y'all. Uh, before we get this literary pachanga started, allow me to take care of one more last detail and read the bios for our two, uh, two amazing presenters tonight. So joining Roberto is uh, the one and only Miriam Gurba, who's a Mexican-American writer, storyteller, and visual artist from Santa Maria Califas. 
She is the author of Dahlia Season Stories and a Novella, Wish You Were Here, painting their portraits in winter stories and our personal favorite, Mean, as well as a chingon amount of other chat books and various articles, essays, and short stories which have been internationally published. In 2019, oh, the Oprah Magazine held Gerba's work, Mean, as one of the best LGBTQ books of all time. Damn, they're right. And you know, usually we have a, a book that I hold up for, for Miriam, but uh, we keep selling out of Miriam's books here, so I can't even keep them on the shelf. So that's, that, 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 that's it. I'm sorry I don't have Miriam's book. And Roberto, man, I'm going to read Robert's bio right at the back of his jacket. Roberto Lovato is a journalist, a member of the Writer's Grotto, and a co-founder of Dignidad Literaria. Y'all know what that is. I know you do. His writings appeared in Guernica, the Boston Globe, Foreign Policy, The Guardian, and many, many other publications, y'all. So without further ado, let's pass the mic over to the one and only Roberto Lovato and Miriam Gorba, y'all. Give them some love, welcome them, give them some jazz hands, huh? Give them some jazz hands. Thank you, uh, Josiah. Um, thank you, City Lights, for the honor to be with you tonight. Thank you to all that are watching, and especially thank you to Miriam, my uh, uh, compañera de formula in the Tignidad Literaria movement, and an exceptional writer in her own right, and a friend. Um, I just a little, little brief note I want to say about City Lights and me. I'm a local San Franciscan. I grew up in the Mission District, as you read in my book, on uh, 25th and Folsom, down the street from the projects. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I used to, I, my, my, my criminal and literary career actually started together. I started stealing books from the Mission Branch Library, who I'm actually going to have an event with the SFPL. So, you know, don't out me. I'm going to make amends with them, trust me. Um, and uh, you know, eventually I graduated to going to bookstores like Modern Times, which is now defunct and didn't survive the, the Amazon, you know, uh, tsunami. But City Lights has, and I'm so edified that they have uh, even survived COVID, and we have to really support them. Uh, I, 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 they, when I was a, you know, started getting literate at a certain, in a certain way in San Francisco with this rich literary culture, City Lights was my dealer of choice of for microdosing and macrodosing words of all colors and hallucinogenic effects. And they helped me disorganize my senses in the way that poets are supposed to disorganize people's senses, especially at a time with, when the totalitarian instincts of the society are organizing our senses in very deep and scary ways that we can talk about. I can tell you a little bit about that as a Salvadoreño who is face down totalitarianism. And so, uh, I mean, these are precious institutions. And, so, and, and, and it, it goes to its founder, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who I have so, a little bit of history with. I want to share, uh, if I may, a uh, little bit of uh, visuals here. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. OK. Yeah. So there, there we are looking awkward with this great poet. He's just telling me, who the fuck are you, guy? Um, you know, I, I used to go to City Lights also uh, to, to look for, and I found one of the most important um, uh, anthologies of its time, uh, Volcan, edited by my friend Alejandro Murguia, who uh, is one of many Guerrero poets uh, in San Francisco. And there's a whole tradition of Guerrero poets. And some of them came and would sit in this chair there, the, the poet's chair. Um, uh, and, and, and I, I, I never did, because I never felt like a poet, you know. And um, I, uh, okay, am I, am I off screen share now? Uh, you, yes, you are. Okay, good. I'm out. So, um, you know, I mean, there's a history with Lawrence Ferlinghetti and the Beats in San Francisco, deep. Uh, and, and they're deeply connected to Central American, Centro Americanos. People like my friend Roberto Vargas, another guerrilla poet who was born in Nicaragua but raised in the Mission District, went to Mission High School like I did, and Santana and others. I mean, at different times. And um, 
you know, uh, Roberto was influenced by Perlingetti and Allen Ginsberg, but then he in turn influenced them by inviting them to Nicaragua. And you can see their influ his influence and our influence in the work that uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti produced about, you know, seven days in Nicaragua and, and, and the writings of Ginsburg around Nicaragua. And so there's kind of this back and forth that you don't often hear about. It's usually the white dudes who are kind of northernly kind of just dropping knowledge to the poor little brown people. And I just, you know, I really, I really love how uh, City Lights and, 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 and company have supported you know, the revolutionary movements of our community, including people like, um, you know, Nina Serrano, who, who's a poet here locally and a writer. And, um, you know, and so, so I just thank you for helping me move from stealing books to stealing ideas in your books. Because <laughs> uh, that's what we do as writers, right? we steal ideas. Uh, I forget who said that, but that's true. So with, with what further ado, I want to introduce, you know, Miriam again, a five foot giant who I had the honor of joining when we went and we scared the living shit out of um, uh, some of the most powerful people in publishing at Macmillan with Dignidad Literaria. Yes. And, and I was Miriam- gonna, I was gonna dive into that. And with that then, let me just not take Miriam's lines and uh, <laughs> take it away, Miriam. Okay, so I, I wrote sort of a really brief introduction to kind of dive into our conversation about Dignidad. So this is a, a very brief introduction, a word about art, revolution, and camaraderie. So I wrote, Roberto, eres mi carnal, and you're also my comrade. My path crossed with yours through literary criticism. You contacted me after having read my essay, Pendeja, you ain't Steinbeck, my bronca with fake ass social justice literature. And you introduced yourself, explaining that you're a writer, activist, organizer, and strategist. You asked if I'd like to join you in a fight against racial capitalism, more specifically in a rumble with the white supremacist publishing industry and Macmillan books. Because I've always enjoyed a good fight, I agreed to join forces with you. So given that, Roberto, could you talk a bit about the development of Dignidad Literaria and how your memoir belongs to that movement? Okay, well, first of all, let me set the record straight. I love her, <laughs> she's an inveterate kind of myth maker. The, 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 the start of Dignidad Literaria is Miriam, Miriam's vision and values that she expressed so eloquently and, 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 and acidically sharp in that essay that you read uh, uh, about that, you know, nonsensical book, American Dirt, that is for many in the United States, the definitive book about immigration, about the crisis of the humanitarian crisis of America and about Central Americans, even though she made the characters Mexican, because she took a Central American story and made it Mexican. So I noticed that. I noticed what she did. I've been, you know, in Mexico. I've talked to the people in La Bestia, the, the train that goes north. I've, I know the story intimately for 30 years since I started seeing, you know, bombings in El Salvador of, you know, adobe homes with children and stuff. And, 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 I've, and I'm born here in the U.S. and I know the status of Latino literature. And so when you have, you know, this, this book come out, I'm like really bothered as a, as, a, as, a, as a reading person. And I was disturbed as a Central American and I was profoundly like, like moved as a Salvadoreño to say, well, I'm going to do something about this. I'm doing something about it, which is my book. I was editing it. But I also want to do something about this using that other side of us, which is the political side, because I come up from, from a tradition, as I've described with City Lights, of a poet warrior tradition, where the distinction between politics and poetry is, didn't really exist in my formation as either a writer or as a political person, because I, 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 I got to have a sense of the Salvadoran Revolution and the Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan Revolution that also moved Galliano, Cortazar, Salman Rushdie, you know, the, some of the Gunter Grass, some of the great writers of their time, you know, kind of orbited around Central American Revolution because they were so inspired. Uh, Salman Rushdie even said that he'd never seen uh, people so uh, interwoven with the poetry, where poetry is so much a part of the culture as Nicaragua, for example. So coming from that and looking at American dirt, it's like, oh my God, let's just, you know, let's do something about this. And I saw, the opportunity and what you did, Miriam. Thank you. 
So, so the other day I was speaking to a writer, um, Carla Cornejo Villavicencio, um, and I was talking to her about um, her work, The Undocumented Americans, and she mentioned to me that nobody ever asks her who her literary or intellectual influences are. And I mean, we can, we can assume that that is likely because she's Latina and people assume that we don't read. And it seems that those of us who write about race and immigration are often thought of as having no literary lineage. We're perceived as being detached from any literary canon. So I wanted to ask what writers, thinkers, revolutionaries, and specific figures shaped unforgetting. So if you were to place it within a genealogy of thinkers, writers, etc who would be in that family tree? Well, at the top would be, not of a literary canon, but of a literary AK-47, Roque Dalton, who, well, if you don't know, was uh, one of the greatest poets in Latin America in the 70s, and incidentally, a revolutionary to boot. Again, there's that thing you're gonna keep hearing about that mm -hmm. you don't hear about in the current conceptions of US literature because, you know, it's kind of corporatized and writers kind of, especially writers of color, try to mangle themselves to fit the literary, what's defined as the literary. Mm -hmm. And I won't send, mention any names, so I don't want to diss anybody, but you can, you, you will know, you shall know them by their folkloric outfits. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Rocky Valton would be one uh, great poet uh, who was admired by Cortázar and so many others. Uh, you'd have to put uh, June Jordan, who is a teacher and who I learned from at Berkeley. You know, she taught poetry for the people and she was like, I, had, I took a class with a guy named Leonard Nathan, who's an eminent poet at his, in, his, in his moment, was affiliated with Czesław Milos and mm -hmm. some of the other like uh, poets. They were who all were, at Cal. There was like yeah, a and, they, and they were embraced. Poets at Cal and they were embraced by empire. Mm -hmm. right? Even the liberal poets were embraced by empire. So June Jordan would have none of that. And she took things in another direction with her still visionary poetry for the people uh, classes. Uh, so I'd have to put her in there. I'd have to put Audre Lord. I just love Audre Lord. Uh, uh, a lot of Latin American writers, Galliano, uh, Toni Morrison, in terms of like this current book has a lot of underworld themes in it. Yes. So you'd have to go look at Dante, uh, the Bible. The Bible was the first book I really read. Uh, mm -hmm. And as you know, people will read, I, I became a right-wing fascist, born-again Christian. And I did it in part because I was uh, not, I did, I, I was so rebellious, I didn't take my first Holy Communion. My mom guilt tripped the head out of me. And then a friend of mine planted the seeds of evangelical Christianity to get out of a lifestyle we were in. And so the Bible kind of, you know, gave up the seeds of, of right-wing fascism. And, and it wasn't until uh, El Salvador that I kind of caught wind of the beautiful wind and I breathed in the winds of liberation theology to transform my notion of God and of and of people and, and of and of liberation. So, uh, you know, James Baldwin. I could go on. I mean, let's just go to the <laughs> lights, you know, poetry <laughs> section and downstairs and, and and upstairs, and you'll find plenty of stuff. I was so excited to see um, the many mentions and references to June Jordan because when I was an undergrad, one of the highlights of my experience at Cal was attending a panel. Um, and there were a lot of eminent linguists, sociologists, and other academics on the panel, but I don't remember what any of them said. What they said was dull, but June Jordan was on the panel and she eclipsed everybody. Like her presence and her genius eclipsed everybody's. And the panel had been convoked in order to discuss um, the Oakland uh, uh, school district Board of Education's move to declare AAVE uh, a second language. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and June Jordan read an essay about Black English that, um, that was so incredibly awe-inspiring. I remember I sat there with my mouth hanging open the whole time because I, I knew I was in the presence of, of somebody great. So my next question uh, has more to do with the, the structure, structure and craft. So when considering unforgetting structure, the idea that kept springing into my mind was a chapulín, a grasshopper, right? Because of the way that the structure sort of 
jumps, the way that the narrative thread leaps about. So as a narrator, you leap across time and space in ways that while uh, they're, they seem broadly unpredictable, manage to still build momentum. And the reader kind of chases after you, wondering where she's being led. So I was wondering, how did you develop this Chapulin-esque structure? Oh boy, that's a difficult question. And this is part of my problem of choosing Miriam Gerba as my interlocutor. <laughs> um, no, nah, seriously, I, uh, you know, I was searching for a structure when I embarked on this journey in 2015 after um, going to a, 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 a child and mom prison in South Texas, you know, where there, nobody's going to go see them. Uh, and, you know, the Obama administration had hidden these jails in the deep south. I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody's liberal sensibilities, but that's just fucking true. And I was moved to like, okay, this is it. I've got to spill my beans now. There was this, an incident there at that prison that, and I was inspired too by the women and the children who actually had agency as I demonstrate, unlike most of my peers in the media who never show any agency. They just have the poor little immigrant mom and the suffering child sound bites, you know. Uh, so um, I, you know, I started this journey in 2015 and then I'm, I'm like, God damn, but there's so much to tell. Like there's the past and my dad, there's, there's my experience with El Salvador, my experience in the U.S. Uh, you know, there's the present situation, the gangs, and these are all things that I connect in, in my experience, but how the hell am I going to put them together? And I, you know, I started taking classes and I had a teacher named Brad Kessler, a good writer, actually. I hope City Lights carries him. And Brad introduced me to this idea of the braided narrative. Mm -hmm. Then I read a, an essay by, uh, he gave me an essay by Lydia Yuknovich. Mm, I love Lydia. Um, yeah, and she, Lydia's essay, and I heard Lydia speak too, and Lydia's really brilliant. And, uh, you know, I started like, you know, I started seeing, oh, okay, so uh, I can use this braided thing to, 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 to do a whole book. Little did I know, it takes a lot of work just to have one essay be braided, but to have a whole damn book. My colleagues at the Writers' Grotto, some of whom are here, and I would ask City Lights to delete along with all the Salvadorans in the audience today because they make me nervous. Um, seriously, I, I love that my people are here. But like, you know, my friends at the Grotto have seen my, um, I have these charts that I kind of slice up different time periods and different themes across you know, like an Excel spreadsheet yeah. to kind of organize my thoughts. And it took me years to, to kind of a couple of years to really get it. And mm -hmm. I feel, I feel good about it. I will, the reader will be judged, you know, cause it's, oh, and I, and I realized that at the end that you have to like have short chapters to be able yep. to successfully do this. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then uh, speaking of chapel, it's funny because I had a, um, un responsable, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the FMLN and in the Salvadoran structures, you have somebody in the guerrilla structures who's the person you're, who's responsible to oversee kind of your work and kind of, you know, uh, your, 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 your militancy, you know, they're like, they're like your supervisor. <laughs> if we're talking in capitalist talk, right? So, um, so my, 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 my responsable was a guy who would jump they llamaban el grillo, the grasshopper, boom. See, sí, boom, 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 yeah. Boom, boom, boom. And so we as Salvadorans, I mean, people, if you don't know it, we are hyper-political people uh, that according to the CIA had formed one of the most effective people's movements in Latin America in the 20th century. One of every three Salvadoreños was organized against the state. And the way we, they, they, that we, they did it was in fact the ability to, to, to cross the country back and forth at clandestine hideouts and create kind of an underground, uh, underground literally like in caves in the, in the countryside, but also an underground across the entire country. And then, then, then when the war went, was formally declared in the, in the early 80s, then the structures went global and they created this underground movement so that, for example, um, you know, nobody knows that Central American Salvadorans created CISPIS, Committee of Solidarity to People of Salvador. Hundreds of thousands of people organized, but it was always the Salvadorans. And there are no books, however, that said we did it. Not, not me, because it was more of the Salvadoreños who had come in the 80s, early 80s, that, that did that. And, and so I, I, I thought that this, this ability to hop around is one of our superhero, like El Chapulín Colorado in Mexico, like hop around. Like, and, and, and so, uh, 
that's where the braided structure comes from. And I also think one last thing. I think I also needed to talk about, I don't use the word trauma hardly, except maybe twice in the book. And it's somebody else uses the term. They told it to me. Yes. And so I don't use the word trauma because I want the reader to understand, go come to that themselves, where I inherited an atom bomb from my father, an atom bomb of a secret of trauma. And trauma memory itself is already fragmented by its nature. Mm -hmm. But then when you add trauma to it, it's an even more fragmented thing. And so uh, in order to show the way that I inherited trauma and I, the consciousness that I had coming from the ignorance of trauma that I inherited and that made me do crazy things as a kid to then um, coming to awareness like, boom, oh my God, I've inherited this, this epic history that I didn't even know I had in my family. Mm -hmm. And so the braided structure just seemed perfect to show the different phases of coming to a, of, of trauma creation and then coming to understand the trauma. Definitely. I mean, it, it's as if you um, are recovering the broken pieces of like some sort of vessel and you're, you're putting them back together. You know what I mean? In, 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 in a manner of like forensic recovery. Well, um, if I, can, can I say something about that, Mary? Because oh, you hit on it. Well, the, 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 there's another la layering in the book that is a layering of a thematic layer. And a, like there's three different sim symbolically. There's three symbols in the book. One is um, the, the, the forensic. I, I spend a lot of time with forensic scientists who are literally piecing together the bones to bring together in the initial story of the crime of murder. Right, most of the, the, El Salvador is covered in mass graves from the war and now from the gangs. And some of them are layered on top of each other and they're co-mingled. And there's no, most murders are un, uninvestigated and therefore unstoried, untold. Yep. So uh, uh, the, the, the forensics, there's a romance in forensics, people don't understand, and the history of it, where they're putting together the story of the, the crime, but they're also putting together the story of the person for the family that has what they call luto prolongado, prolonged mourning, where you don't know why your child was disappeared. You don't know why your husband or your wife was taken away from you by the Salvadoran military and its US henchmen that would train them, right? And, and so the forensic scientist puts together the bones of the body, get, literally gives them back and gives the integrity of the story back to the family. It's such a powerful, so I saw a, a connection between that and the second fray uh, level, which is uh, the, the sewing together of my abuelita Mama Te. My grandmother would sew together disparate pieces in, in, in a depression era El Salvador that made Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath look like a wine tasting festival or something. Uh, you know, and so like uh, my grandmother in, the, in, in a shanty town sewed for prostitutes the, dis the disparate pieces of cloth that became the dresses that gave those, some of those women a, a, a semblance of identity back that had been taken away from them behind these labels of puta and, and India and these other racist and misogynist labels. And so I see myself writing, doing the same thing, piecing together the bones of our history. It's, a, it's healing. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to kind of circle um, back to California now and, 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 and Voices of California. So at the beginning and at the end of Unforgetting, you invoke Joan Didion, the California <laughs> gringa whose observations have not only become synonymous with El Salvador, her monograph has become the primary literary vehicle that shapes U.S. imaginings of the country. And you take the infamous line that Didion mapped onto the topography and you transform it and you rewrite it as follows, quote, if terror is the given of the place, so too is love. So that's how you reinterpreted it. So although Unforgetting has a romantic thread running through it, you relate the story of your love affair with the female revolutionary named G, I find love being most richly expressed through several other instances. Your relationship with your mother and your father, um, your relationship to music and poetry, and various descriptions of food. <laughs> you write very lovingly about food. Uh, especially food. that ham sandwich with the atole. Okay, so, <laughs> so can you talk a bit about love and beauty being a given of the place? <laughs> yeah, um, 
I have a friend, Morelia Rivas, who would not forgive me if I wouldn't have said something in the book about Joan Didion, because she was like, ah! A lot of Salvadoreños who read in English know this. A lot of critical people know this about Joan Didion. She's a fabulous writer, but um, she's also got her limits in her, in her imagination. And she basically tried to do like William, I mean, uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, creating the, 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 the you know, war torn El Salvador uh, kind of image and, and reducing Salvadorans to two dimensional images. So like, yeah, she said, terror is the given of the place. And I actually, in addition to the quote that you put, I also put another quote that's in there. And I just said, love is the given of the place. Mm -hmm. She spent two weeks uh, in mostly in the with, the, with the embassy people and in air conditioned, you know, I, I spent 56 years with El Salvador from birth, uh, when my family would take me down there. I was born here in San Francisco. And my conclusion was, love, how could you say it's just terror? There's terror, there's no doubt. But love is the given of the place. That was my experience. It is my experience of Salvadoran. And I could not write without saying that about myself, about my family, about the people of El Salvador. You know, and, and 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 trying to like, you know, starting to open up a new space because I was, you know, as a political person, I was very aware that this is the first um, major publishing, uh, the first nonfiction book by a major U.S. big five publisher that uh, is written by and about U.S. based Salvadoreños Centroamericanos. That's a tall order for me, and I take the responsibility seriously as I took my revolutionary work. So love. You know, and love love extends to the family in, in these in these ways, but it's also love in in the revolutionary sense, which is in the poetry and the music that you see in the book. Because you know, after listening to Trio Los Panchos, Los Condes, Sabor a Mi, and all the beautiful music with my family, I then you know, and then lowrider music with my homies, you know, the Midnighters in L.A. and Swa Malo, and of course Santana, who went to school with my brother. Um, you know, I started getting in at that moment with Santana's music, a sense of San Francisco in the 60s and 70s where all these powerful electric currents of consciousness from black power, brown power, queer power, um, you know, women's movement, um, and the revolutionary movements. There was a, I mentioned these people at the beginning, like uh, Roberto Vargas and, and Nina Serrano and other people who had contact or were directly involved in the revolutionary organizations. They were all poets too, and they were here. Yeah. I mean, even before that, there's a guy from the Cuban revolution you may have heard of, is Camilo Cienfuegos, who was living in the, out, out, outside of the mission. So there's this whole history of revolution, poetry yeah. and literature, music that I wanted, that I, I was blessed to be a part of at the tail end of the Cold War. And I'm sharing it now because I think given what we have to face, we have to have some of that millenarian sensibility. Yeah. That revolución o muerte attitude towards um, uh, uh, social change, because we're not going to Democrat, liberal, or progressive our way out of Donald Trump, yeah. Kamala Harris, Biden, climate change, COVID-19. We're going to need something a little stronger. Yeah. And I think I'm pointing people, I, I published the book with a mind to communicate that and, and to incite people to embrace their inner revolutionary right now. Excellent. That's so funny. Like as you were mentioning uh, songs from the book and the sort of playlist and soundtrack that emerges from it, what I kept thinking of was uh, the, the gang convocation and the love of Kenny G. Isn't there like there's a... <laughs> where all these ardent men can only agree upon listening to Kenny G. That was one of my favorite parts. Okay, so so there's a moment in-, in I like one Kenny G song. I'm just gonna admit, I won't say which one, but just for the record. <laughs> so there's a moment in Unforgetting when you're being teased by family in El Salvador about being a gringo and mm -hmm. you struggle with being a child of both countries, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And this struggle reminded me of similar teasing that has taken place in my family. Um, and the anecdote is that my, my grandfather, my abuelito, 
who was a Mexicano, used to tease my dad, his son-in-law, who is a Chicano, about being both a Mexican and a United States citizen. And my abuelito once asked my dad, if a war between the United States and Mexico was to happen, which side would you be on? And my <laughs> father answered, which side do you choose when your mother and father fight? And after my father said that, my abuelito stopped bothering him. <laughs> sorts of questions. And you resolve the tension created by the hyphen, right, Salvadoran American, by just excising the American part. And I interpreted that as a fuck you to President Monroe and to the Monroe Doctrine, which asserted U.S. hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. That's how I read that. So your book is as much a history of the United States as it is a history of El Salvador. How did you strike that historical balance? Boy, I don't know, man. You have to have some PhD to research that one for me. So. <laughs> but uh, let me just say a little bit about my my feelings about nations in the book that are there. I, yes. You, you, nothing will will wake you up to the nature of nations like war mm -hmm. and mass murder and genocide. And so, um, you know, I, I start off the book with a quote that I'm gonna I'm gonna share with folks if I may. Mm -hmm. It says it's by Ernest Renan. Uh, historian of nations and one of the early theorists of nations. He's a little controversial in, in, in some ways, but still somebody who had some important things to say about the origins of nations. And he says, and I will quote, forgetting, I would even say historical error is an essential factor in the creation of a nation. And it is for this reason that the progress of historical studies often poses a threat to nationality. Historical inquiry, in effect, throws light on the violent acts that have taken place at the origin of every political formation, even those that have been the most benevolent in their consequences. Unity is always brutally established. So, I mean, my simple kind of mission, 24th and Folsom Street way of saying it is, hey man, just look under the hood, and I use a lot of car metaphors, because we used to low ride with my friend Armando Vasquez and other people, um, you look under the hood of any nation state, you're going to find the bones and bodies of indigenous people slaughtered by genocide. And that's not just the United States, that's Mexico, mm -hmm. that's El Salvador, that's Guatemala, you name it. And so the nation state structure itself is a, is a big political problem for us, it's abstract. And I wanted to kind of bring the political thinking and the analysis to people in a way that was well, kind of like the Matrix movie. I hope it's entertaining because it's got like action. I, there's action in there. There's there's a love story, and so um, you know, you, I, 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 again, the braided structure allowed me to jump Chapulín like from reality to reality. And I have the great good fortune. One of my superhero powers was given to me by my parents. It was that my father was a janitor with United Airlines. My mom was a maid for Hyatt Regency. So therefore, I was the best travel kid in the mission and any body in the United States. So I had what Shakespeare called rich eyes and poor hands. So, you know, I was able to see the world, Europe and other places uh, where my friends didn't even have lived, left 60 miles outside of the mission and the projects that we live right near. And so uh, I was able to leap back and forth to El Salvador, like my dad who had this whole contraband that's a part of my story as well, right? The underworld of crime in the Mission District and how my dad extended it to El Salvador selling electrodomestics, um, you know, clothing, perfume, and eventually like jewelry. And then he started running guns, mm -hmm. not to the revolutionaries, but to, to anybody who would buy them there. And so my dad and my mom and my abuelita, who was actually the originator, Mama Te, my grandmother, was the one who came up with this idea to start taking uh, before my dad started taking airplanes, she started taking boats, boxes and boats there. She had her 38 special that she would defend herself with on these boats. And so um, I, I, you know, I kind of look at the, you know, the, the way that nations construct criminality yeah. in my own family stories. Like I'm not going to call my abuelita Mama Te a criminal. They were people using, what, extremely poor people using what was ever at their disposal to resolve a problem, which was poverty. Mm -hmm. So that makes people make some people uncomfortable, but lo siento. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. So I have um, two more questions, and and then we can transition into like just a general audience Q and A. 
So my next question is um, related to violence. So Unforgetting draws a line that traces the origins of broken windows policing in El Salvador to the United States. And this style of fascist policing has US roots and is a political export. You also discuss the development of counterinsurgency policing, which is being used to crush the uprisings happening currently in the United States. Mm -hmm. And you note in Unforgetting that counterinsurgency policing blurs the boundary between police and military. So I wanted to ask, is there still a distinction between police and military, given how blurred those lines have become? And if a distinction remains, what is it? What is that line that still separates those two entities? Yeah, I mean, I, I bring, what, I, what I'd like to say is my, one of the ways you can look at my book, it's an, an intimate, uh, uh, an intimate uh, dive into the workings of uh, the circuits of counterinsurgency policing and counterinsurgency, the dark, the heart of darkness of counterinsurgency policing, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's not just, it's not the gangs that are the heart of darkness, it's the larger Heart of Darkness, that is the empire. Yeah. It's kind of part of the problem of that whole frame of Heart of Darkness. It was kind of the, the empire looking anthropologically out at the world and othering others. So we have to kind of take that back. So I'm looking at the Heart of Darkness that is US style policing and militarism. So the answer to your question, is there a distinction? Just look at the uniforms, for example, of those men that kidnapped uh, those protesters in, um, in Portland, puffy, camouflaged, heavily armed. And, but the thing is, they were not just um, Robocop, they were paramilitary because they had unmarked vans. They had no identification. They didn't read people their rights. They simply grabbed them and threw them in. I know that from El Salvador, because as you read in the book, I was pursued by Esquadrones de la Muerte, paramilitary death squads trained by the US in El Salvador. And mm -hmm. so, I start looking at this and I'm like, whoa, okay, so I was in I was in LA when I was in El Salvador and I remember US military advisors being there training the Atlacat Battalion that slaughtered, for example, a thousand people at El Mosote, half of them children, half of those children under half of those children under twelve, and then half of the ones killed under twelve under six. This is the kind of heroism and heroism that the US military was training. So then after the war, I found trainers that went from El Salvador to guess where? Your, your local neighborhood police department, mm -hmm. Seattle, Portland, mm -hmm. LA. And suddenly you start seeing kind of like these counterinsurgency methods, COIN, COIN, applied to um, local policing. Yeah. And so um, the the, uh, I, saw them, I saw them bring it to places like LA and I saw when the gangs in 92 during the riots, which is one of the opening scenes in my book, started being heavily policed in this counterinsurgent way by LAPD. And then, and then the person that helped really Mac, uh, build this is an avatar of fascism, William Barr, the Attorney General of the United States. Not now, but in 1992 under the Bush, Bush administration. So these are the things we're forgetting that I wanna unforget that William Barr then deployed 300 FBI agents away from fighting external terrorists to fighting gangs domestically like the Crips, the Bloods and Mara Salvatrucha. He, they then exported with the Immigration Nationalization Service which was under William Barr, the gang structures of the United States to El Salvador. Mm -hmm. And then they exported the policing model back to El Salvador to train the post-war policing. And so you have these circuits of counterinsurgency that I had an intimate look at and uh, a first-hand look because, for example, I have the, like with some of my compañeros here, have a the dubious distinction of being pursued by Esquadrones de la Muerte in El Salvador, but also in places like LA. Yeah. Part of the point of my book is really to kind of incite my Salvadoran revolutionary comrades to come out of the closet and speak your revolutionary truth at a time that the world needs it. Te necesitamos ahorita, compa basically is my message for the Salvadorans, is that we need to share our analysis, our understanding of policing, of militarism, and how to fight and defeat them, right? And, Which and that, that's, that takes me to the last question. So I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we'll turn to the chat to see what uh, questions have come from the audience. So 
You wrote, and I quote, like absent or abusive fathers, the political parties, governments, and countries we grew up with and even loved often end up hurting and forsaking us, end quote. So I was going to mention that, you know, I have survived abusive men. And one of the most dangerous periods for a woman who's being terrorized by a batterer is, uh, doesn't occur when she's in the relationship with a batterer. It occurs during separation. And batterers tend to respond to a woman's liberation with separation violence. And this is why I tend to think of a woman's escape from a batterer as a personal revolution. It's a revolution that happens on a micro scale and on a local scale. So could you talk a bit about the need for revolution on a macro scale? If we're gonna revolt against an abusive state, how do we fight? How do we move forward? How do we prepare for the imminent separation violence likely to be caused by us separating from that state? Okay, madam, you've just put me in the position of having to write a PhD thesis <laughs> uh, that I could hardly begin to answer this question. If I had that question, I would have put that on my title and sold more books than American Dirt, because people <laughs> want to know. <laughs> that said, in the pages of my book, I think is my best answer to your question, which is, you know, you, there's, n we won't build a revolution without building a culture of revolution. You know, we need to think about what sustainability, not just for the climate, but for our social movements that are going to address the disequilibrium of the planet, right? Like I believe any revolutionary has to, um, has to address the question of disequilibrium between humans and the planet and the disequilibrium and how that causes the systems, the life preserving systems of the planet to go into severe disequilibrium that is wiping out species by the thousands, the thousands, right? Kids are gonna grow up without seeing lions, thousands. So um, I don't know what being a revolutionary means anymore because uh, I don't think it's just about taking the nation state anymore. And so we have to think about building a culture that starts answering those questions. And I think that's the beginning of any movement is, is, the, is in the imagination and the imagination beyond the terror. Mm -hmm. right? Part of what I'm trying to do in my book is to preserve the tenderness that is often lost in the terror, in our memories, because that's, that's a big problem, right? You can't get to the, you can't get to the, Sometimes it, the monstrous will hide the marvelous, right? And we, we have to kind of get through our traumas to then unrelease. I can tell you writing this book has been such a, I'm not saying write a book and start the revolution, but you know, start revolutionizing your thinking. I mean, we're not going to Democrat re, uh, or, or progressive or intersectional Kamala Harris and Beyonce our way out of this. It's a little more complicated. And I think it's more serious. And so I come from a serious kind of political background, which was the Salvadoreño revolutionary experience. There are others. And that's why, again, I incite others to take on revolutionary thought. And I think we all have to start thinking in more consciously and, and openly revolutionary terms, just exploring what that means. And then taking that on as a, as a calling because, uh, we have a millenarian moment that the human race is living and mm -hmm. we're not going to get through it with through elections. Mm -hmm. That's just not going to happen. So um, that's, I'll, that, I'll leave it there. Excellent. So we're going to now shift gears and we're going to move to the questions that have appeared in the chat. Yeah. Um, so uh, Josiah, do you want to take those? Should I take yeah. those? I'll, I'll do it. I feel like a, a man. I, I hate right. to interrupt this conversation, though, man. Ihole. Um, yeah, but there's definitely questions in the chat for folks. So um, let me just start them off. Uh, let's see here. From uh, Joseph wants to know, Roberto, uh, you talk about Joan Didion Salvador. What are your thoughts on other literature about El Salvador? Uh, I.e., Carolyn Forge, Oscar Martinez, Horacio Castellanos Moya, who I love him. Yeah. What oh, yeah. Think of them, Ross is a great writer. I mean, Carolyn Forche is a, a, a great writer. Her, her, I bought, in fact, I bought um, the poetry of, of, uh, of Witness at City Lights. I remember. Mm -hmm. Great collection. And like, you know, Carolyn got, a, got a, a sense of the Salvadoran revolution herself and of the Salvadoran terror. And she took that and it transformed her as a North Americana poet. You know, it helped define her as a, 
in many ways, as I read her. Uh, Oscar Martinez, very intrepid journalist who has put himself on the line time and again to go out and, 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 and but you know, we don't need to go that far. We have Salvadoran writers, Nicaraguan, Central American writers here. There's an anthology that's uh, being reprinted called The Wandering Song, edited by my friend Leticia Hernandez, a, a, a great local poet, uh, Hector Tobar, yeah. Guatemalan writer. She just and read Ruben, out the Sweet Lights window yeah. about, uh, last week. I saw the picture and, and Ruben <laughs> Martinez. So, and you, you, know, you have, you know, Maya Chinchilla locally here and you have, you know, there's a, there, there's part of purpose of my book in the world off the page is to simply use it to kind of go, all right, you like this, this ain't nothing. There's way more where this came from, publishing industry, readers. Right now you have to go to smaller presses, you know, like City Lights to read Central American writers, but that's gonna change because Central American writers are going to rise up to the occasion of themselves. Yeah, 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 most definitely. So uh, Judy Roach asks, uh, besides police being trained by, the mili uh, for, by military, do you think there is secret policing in Portland as in from Bortex Security Services, <laughs> Prince Mercenaries, Blackwater? Yes. And yeah, yeah. The, that, that's a good question. I think Blackwater is a set private entity. This private policing, which is a whole other issue. Like, I used to write about surveillance as well. Like, my first beat as a journalist was surveillance, and like, you know, Orwell's 1984 is no longer adequate to the surveillance moment, right? It's not Big Brother. It's Nano Sister, uh, Micro Cousin. It's and it's corporate, right? The U.S government is now in the business of uh, decentralized surveillance and it's really about processing the information they gather from the private sector into their systems to have data mining technology like which is what you see in what uh edward snowden and the service he did all of us by revealing what they did so but as far as like bortac which is the immigrant which is the border patrols militarized policing unit that you saw in action in portland that they began being trained at a place called the School of the Americas around 2000 by under the administration of who? Donald Trump? No. Barack Hussein Obama sent the first Bortec agents to a place called the School of the Americas. For those of you that don't know, it's now W-H-I-N-S-E-C, WINSEC. And when it was School of the Americas, it's called School of the Assassins, School of the Dictators, because that's where pretty much every major mass murderer, general, colonel, in, and, and, and lieutenant, and, and lieutenant colonel, in modern Latin American history has been trained to, 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 to conduct the mass murders of hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people. And so the UN, under the Obama administration, the Border Patrol started sending trainers to WINSEC, to, to the School of the Americas, because I refuse to call it WINSEC, right? and uh, getting this training to do this paramilitary work. So um, I think it, we have a bipartisan problem of policing. Just look at the positions of Biden and Kamala Harris with respect to what they've said about policing and dismantling these re increasingly repressive structures and dangerous structures. So, you know, we're not gonna progressive our way out of this folks. This next question actually is sort of I think you answered part of it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it anyway, Roberto. Uh, Shahid asks, uh, you discuss paramilitary policing and the cycle of corruption between the US and El Salvador. Have you seen any voices in US politics who have challenged that edifice? Have Democrats shown up to promote alternatives or have they generally proven themselves complicit in the rise of that particular dimension of fascism? Well, Ilhan Omar has been outspoken uh, on Venezuela and other issues that people are following, are following the Democrats on. You know, um, uh, Shahid himself, he's running a, against uh, uh, our, our Congress member here, Nancy Pelosi. And Shahid has been very consistent and clear on these kinds of issues. Uh, I, I, you know, unfortunately, and I'm sorry if it's not popular, but I don't hear as much clarity from AOC. I'm sorry, I love her to death, but I love my people more and I, 
and I detest death and the structures of death. We have to be very, that's why it's, we have to adopt, I think a more revolutionary posture before these increasingly repressive policing structures. And so I, I kind of like show that in the book, this is, I, I show you the, the spirit of a peoples that learn not to fear, right? Or, or to, and what that means is to learn to feel the fear and do what you need to do anyway to alter the conditions of the country. I mean, we tried our best and we defeated the Salvadoran military and its US backers, but in the post-war period, there were some mistakes made and you see what's happening in El Salvador now with the gangs and stuff as a result. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Beth wants to know, you write about trauma, Roberto, as fragmenting and stitching, sewing as healing. Did writing this book and constructing this narrative help you heal? <laughs> you can ask the one person who was the object of my anger more than anyone, uh, in addition to Ronald Wilson Reagan. And that's my father. My father, in the course of writing, I was writing this book, I was doing the work, before I even started writing this book, and I encourage going back to craft issues, if I may, if you're gonna go in and do something like what I did, which is go into the underworld of mass graves, war, and then my own family history, you know, the, the bones of my own history, I strongly encourage you to retain the services of a therapist or to do some kind of ritual or something that helps you prepare for the act of opening up, you know, your, pen, your own private Pandora's box. And so I retained a great therapist and my therapist, uh, you know, in that process, I opened up, I knew I was gonna bring up my own trauma from the past of, you know, the things that I've seen in, with gang violence and the war, but also the intergenerational stuff that's at the heart of my book as well. And so, um, you know, I learned, so you asked my dad and he says, wow, you know, you, you're, uh, you seem softer, son. You know, lo siento más suave. And I go, well, yeah, I've been writing a book, Pop, it's about you. And I, in the process of going back and forth with my dad about the book and what he saw and understanding, you know, that despite his limits, my dad had an experience I'll never know. It's just astonishing, I think, for anybody that reads it will know. It really is astonishing. I'm not just exaggerating. And so I don't want to give it away because it'll give away the, you know, the book, but, uh, but, but so like my dad and, and even other people afterwards say like, Robert Watson, you seem like different. And so oddly enough, and I've never been artsy fartsy that way. Like, um, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the, 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 the arc of, of my story in the book. One of the arcs, there's several arcs, one of which is what Miriam mentioned, how I went from being American, quote unquote, like G.I. Joe, Captain America, cry at the national anthem at Willie Mays and San Francisco Giants games, to becoming American with an accent on the E, a member of a new country that I've created poetically, the United States of America with that accent, which instantly destroys the border in my consciousness. And so that's one arc. The other arc is the love, the arc of my relationship to my father, love, pop, love, hate, pop, love, hate, and love and hate pop and rebel against the state to love pop again. And so the, the process of writing my book actually helped me to understand my relationship to my father in profound ways along with like the therapy and stuff. And it was a beautiful, profound process for me. I'm a, I'm a better person. I have more love and, and more passion and more, I'm fucking more dangerous than I've ever been now because you can't just disarm me with my anger. You know, our, because they can disarm us with our anger and we need to just take that anger and focus it even more. And that's what allowed me to write this book. Yeah. All right, Roberto. Uh, Jessica is asking, she puts in parentheses, this is from Freddie. Uh, in part six of Unforgetting, you share a Nahuatl story of the underworld. Can you share with us what inspired you most about that specific myth and how you came across the narrative? Well, I, I came across it because of my friend, a uh, brilliant geek of a linguistic man, literary man, Rafael Lara Martinez, a uh, little known outside of uh, intellectual circles in El Salvador and here, some in the US. And Rafael has been following in the trajectory of uh, a German anthropologist 
who was the one, one of the people, main people who documented the Nahuatl language. And in the process, you, you, you documented the Nahuatl language, you're gonna come across the stories, the origin stories, the underworld stories of these cultures. And so they, Rafael uh, tells, you know, has a story uh, that he put together based on his research as a, as a linguist and of the Nahuatl underworld and how the concept of underworld in the Nahuatl peoples is involved several layers of underworld where at one level there's this burning place and, and there's all these body parts, but the body parts aren't like horrific or, or hell necessarily. There's hellish things, but they were also the body parts talking mm -hmm. and the body parts are, uh, and the dead generally nourish the living. And so then below that, there's, a, there's like this turquoise, beautiful, like idyllic, kind of psychedelic place below that underworld. And I just thought it was really beautiful and fitting for what I wanted to do, which was go into all these different underworlds that I go into in my real life, the gorilla underworld, the gang underworld, the underworld of my father and family history and my own psychology uh, to kind of bring back the goods of, of gorgeousness and beauty that are hidden behind the monstrosity. So like, um, so Rafael Martinez turned me on to this and, and I thought it was fitting in terms of like the whole metaphor of putting the bones back together. I mean, in the Nahuatl concept, you don't even have to put the bones back together. The bones live, live on their own life and, they're, and, they're, and they do good. And I thank you to my part. friends in New York for that question. That was a planned question. I paid them off to ask that <laughs> question, so. Well, that was a, uh, that, you telling that story, Roberto, also reminded me of the old Nahuatl story of when Quetzalcoatl goes into the underworld and he, he takes the old bones of, uh, of our gente before to make the new bones. So I, I just, I love that, that symbolism of the huesos regenerating into life. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, I want to, you know, again, going back to craft, I'm sorry. I'm kind of like, I teach writing sometimes and I just like craft discussions. And so like, I think I would encourage people to look at the underworld, writers especially, or even non-writers, look at the underworld as a trope for this moment of civilizational crisis. It was made for that. If you look at the religions and mythologies of past cultures that I studied, to, to be able to do this, I found this trope just compelling and profound and beautiful. And it helps me to cope and write and understand things in a way that, that, that other literature can't because, you know, it, 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 uh, it's like the shorthand for civilization, right? It's what they call myth. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Okay, Lisa. Oh man, now all the questions are coming, Roberto. See, this is a, and you, you better sit down. You got you got a while. You got a while, Roberto. <laughs> okay. well, no, we can delete some of them. Someone from my friends, like uh, this one guy wants to talk you're wearing pants under the desk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm no, no. Kidding. Actually, I've done interviews in my underwears, like in Democracy Now. You know, I'm looking. I'm wearing a shirt, but I'm in my calzones. But anyway, that's another story. I shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Lisa Munoz asks, uh, you talked about the cultural revolution. Is there efforts in El Salvador for a cultural revolution on gang culture? Yeah, there are people thinking about these matters. Uh, people here are thinking about them like uh, Homies Unidos. You know, my friend Alex Sanchez, who's a figure in the book, who I owe so much to, to helping me kind of understand in a deeper way the, what, 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 what gang culture is about. Um, yeah, there, there are groups, there's students, there are young people, there are communities. There's, you, have a, you have a poet here in San Francisco, Jorge Argueta, who took, he, Jorge took um, uh, a bunch of books. He raised money and he, ra he got people to control, donate books so that he would take to these communities where all these gangs are and he would share the word in these communities where, they're, where the word is prohibited by poverty and, and, and repression. And it's just a beautiful thing that Jorge did. And I want to make sure I give a shout out to that. Yeah. So uh, let's see, Jesus Sierra asks, how do you think your book, P and Life, would have been different had you grown up somewhere other than La Mission? <laughs> uh, well, okay. well, Jesus Sierra, truth be told, is one of my closest friends in life. And Jesus Sierra has read more than anyone except my editor. I mean, actually, he's read more than anyone. My book, he read every version, except the version that, like, I, I did with my uh, thing. So I have a 
just a shout out for my homie who actually he's making up for the fact that he sold me my first car and the days <laughs> after here's i'm exacting my fucking vengeance um this he sold me this car and then the days after the, the transmission fell out on the 280 over where the 280 goes near the 101 you know that that turn off so payback bro so uh, as far as that question goes um yeah of course the san francisco mission was a magical place when we were growing up i don't know if that's just a nostalgia of memory but god damn if you look at santana's music i listen to it again as a as him being a brilliant artist being able to channel the different currents that are of consciousness that are crossing in california the center of counterculture arguably at that time right black power you know kind of eastern mysticism quote unquote you know the beat poets the remnants of that the brown power you know marches on on bryant street cesar chavez uh, uh, uh the, the rise of the queer movement in san francisco and, and all the literary and other artistic expressions like the murals like san francisco has the highest concentration of murals in the world right i read this in a phd thesis i can't quote it too but trust me and so in addition to that i encountered roberto vargas and the nicaraguan revolutionaries who were scary people to me or the salvadoreños at carecen central american refugee center who were not just refugees but they were also revolutionaries you know lo, 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 los que nunca sabe nadie de donde son, the ones who nobody never knows where they're from, which Stroke Dalton said. You know, there were poets, there were people like Marti Von Galindo, my friend here in the Bay Area, a writer, uh, that people should, they should be household names, but they're not. So um, I would be a completely different person if I was born in a suburb, you know, I'd probably have my fucking engineering degree and be making La Plata, not the riches of a writer, which is not real riches. So. I'd be a completely different person and exposed to, like, I wouldn't be the, if I didn't grow up in the mission, I wouldn't be probably, and I'm gonna offend both you and Miriam right now and Chicanos throughout the US. <laughs> I can dance Norteño music better than most of y'all because I've spent like weeks in, 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 in Durango, Mexico with my friend Armando Vasquez learning Norteños. And so- Roberto, are you wearing botas? You're not wearing pantalones, but you're wearing botas, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that now, actually. No, actually, I could just, one other thing, like, uh, and I was serious about Chicano culture, like, before the Central Americans arrived en masse in the 80s, I had a choice to either assimilate or, and listen to the white police, the white teachers, the white administrators, and the white system, or there were Chicano institutions growing, uh, like the Mission Coalition created institutions like La Raza, organizations, Mission Cultural Center, which Roberto Vargas had a lot to do with creating. And so these, these institutions were, a lot of them were Chicano based and, 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 and their attitude towards their condition in the United States had a profound influence on me. And I have this huge debt that I owe to Chicanos and Chicano culture. The, in addition to just giving me some of the best friends that I have in the world, like my friend Armando I mentioned and others, and Gloria's wife. Beautiful. Okay, uh, Roberto, Judy wants to know, what is your advice to young people coming from El Salvador? How to avoid the allure of the streets, how to stay in school? Well, if you read my book, I may not be advising you to avoid the allure of the streets <laughs> to begin with. You know, I mean, shit, if this is normal, if this is normal, like Virginia Woolf says in Three Guineas, then I'm a fucking barbarian. So I, I, I don't know that I would, I would encourage young people to embrace their inner barbarian, but on your own terms, not in ways that are dangerous to yourself and to humanity, right? Be dangerous to the system, destroy the system, but be good to yourself, be loving to yourself. And so I wrote the book as an act of service and of love. Like my friend, uh, Julia Lithcott Hames from the Grotto says, you know, a memoir is, a, is an act of service. And like, I, I feel that when she said that, because it's true. It's so, uh, I, I think I, I encourage the young people to, to any young person just to pursue the dream. You know, I mean, you know, if you, if you don't pursue the dream, then the dreams of the system will inhabit your consciousness under your skin, will organize your skin, will organize your bones, 
and turn you into an amnesiac, a forgetting person, like the death squad operatives, like amnesia and forgetting make for good soldiers. They make for good cops. They make for good death squad operatives. They make for good gang members who are loyal to the point of killing people without even knowing why they're doing it, right? And so I think uh, we have to get healthy dreams out there more than ever. And I think, honestly, that's a revolutionary act. In all honesty, I can, you know, I've been in political military organizations, so I can say revolutionary and sound kind of, you know, kind of return of the Jedi or some shit, but that's how I feel truly. Yeah, all right, all right. Oh man, actually, so we have time for one more pregunta in a, ooh, look at this one here. Joseph is asking y'all, the title of the talk is The Real American Dirt. What are the effects of recent whitewashed Latino stories like American Dirt? Can white writers help bring to light hidden and unheard stories or is it doing more harm than good? I'm gonna let the leader of our Dignidad Literaria movement start us off in answering that one. Okay, so what are the effects of the of recent whitewashed Latino stories like American Dirt? Can white writers help bring to light hidden and unheard stories or is it doing more harm than good? Um, uh, okay, so I think that like the whitewashed stories that we hear aren't helpful. Um, the whitewash stories that we hear tend to promote stereotypes. And those stereotypes uh, aren't harmless. Those stereotypes are harmful. And those stereotypes provide justification for murder and violence. So literature matters and representation matters as well. And while I'm not going to argue that white writers can't um, represent um, racially minoritized people well, because some of them can, I think that most of them lack the skill to do it and enter into those projects with way too much hubris. And that hubris is a result of white supremacy. White supremacy encourages them to believe that, um, that, that they can master any narrative they want. And that's not true. So I don't think that white writers are um, necessarily useful tools in terms of bringing to light hidden and unheard stories. Why are those stories hidden? Why are those stories unheard? They're hidden because somebody is intentionally hiding them. Somebody is obscuring them. Um, the people who, uh, to whom those stories belong, so to speak, are being ignored, they're being silenced. Um, nobody is voiceless, nobody is faceless. People are intentionally ignored, people are intentionally disappeared. And much of what Roberto writes about is disappearing. And people can be disappeared violently, as he exemplifies through um, paramilitary organizations and death squads, but people can also be disappeared through literature and people can be buried in these whitewashed stories and, and reality can be buried. So I think that if, if, if a white person or a person who belongs to a dominant group, just more broadly, believes that they're on a mission, some sort of mission to excavate um, a story, they ought to really interrogate themselves and they really ought to interrogate their motives because their motives are seldom as innocent as they would like to believe. All right, well, that's another strategic mistake on my part, choosing <laughs> Miriam Gerba to, as my interlocutor because how the hell am I going to follow that up? Uh, all right, but let me try to say something at least halfway smart about this. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, like, I, I agree with a lot of what Miriam says, and I, I don't have the answers for these things in many ways, because I, maybe I don't, no me profundizo lo suficiente. Sometimes I don't, I've been writing a book lately, so, um, but I, I, you know, I, I remember when I started, let me talk about solidarity, and I think it applies to literature. I, I came to solidarity as a kind of a Salvadoran Chicano, right, born here, and ocho, kind of broken Spanish. I had 
white people in solidarity would correct my Spanish. That burned me up. <laughs> <laughs> That's not kind of like the good solidarity, right? It's got me pissed off. But on the other hand, when I started getting more into it, I, I met people like a guy named Don White, who's now dead. Don White gave the latter part of his adult life to the Salvadoran people in El Salvador and in the US. There was consistency, there was a commitment. A lot of people went from El Salvador, the flavor of the revolutionary month, to then Haiti after the war in 92 ended. Don White stayed and lived what, you know, basically Gilberto Brick called, you know, the essential ones, those that fight not one day, not many days, but for their entire lives. And so I met, you know, guerrilleros who were German, Spanish, and who died. I'm like, wow, that's like, like, wow, that's a, I'm not going to knock that sacrifice. Or like my compadre Hector Tovar right now has literally compadre, I'm godfather his kid. I'm not a very good one, but I am. Um, Hector, Hector just wrote a book about a guy named Joe Sanderson. You know, the, the uh, um, um, you know, the last road bump. Really great book. I, I was with him in his, one of his events and, you know, Sanderson's family was on there and Hector reconstructed the story. He gave the bones of, the, of Sanderson's story back to the family after looking through all these documents. I think that um, I like what we did with Dignidad Literaria because there are writers, white writers, who kind of need to look over their shoulders before they start writing about us. And there are writers who should maybe think like, um, hey, you know, is there a Central American writer who I could give this to? Or you could do like Carolyn Forche did in the New York Times. She used her access and knowledge of Think Salvadoran to basically like, like in, in volleyball, boop, and then allow me to go boom yep. in, the, in the pages of the New York Times so that, you know, I, she, she used her access to help this unknown writer that I am, right? And, 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 and in her work, I think it shows as well her, her compendiums of like the writers of different, she's foregrounded as an editor, but the work is really powerful and beautiful from around the world. So I think there's, there's a larger discussion that has to be beyond some of the language. I don't use a lot of this intersectionality and, and, and some of these terms right now that people throw around in these practices continue to erase people that are of like Latino extraction or connected to America Latina. There's like still this like black white conversation that's happening in the United States. And I think solidarity is going to have to reckon with the 60 million of us that are a force in this country and in this world who are connected or descended of America Latina. And we ourselves have to be the first ones to step up and say, look, uh, we are going to uh, rise to the occasion of our own stories. And so sometimes the, the best thing a white person or writer can do is get out of the way and let us tell our own stories. Oh man, I, I do not want to interrupt this. Miriam and Roberto, why don't you all do like a weekly podcast where you just platica for like an hour? The hell? I have a name for it. The Frijoli Gentia Hour. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> that's, that's my coinage and I, I love it. It's like, it's off Zora Neale Hurston because Zora Neale Hurston talked about the N-word, Adi, the, and, 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 and I, I, I wanted to talk I wanted to reinvent the word vendido, sellout, in Spanish, which was a popular term that didn't allow people to go into the INS, into immigration, mm -hmm. whereas now it's an industry, right? Oh, Most yeah. border patrol are Latino. So I wanted to create a term like the binarati, right? For, for the Latino who is a sellout. So I wanted a term to counterbalance it. And the term I came up with was the frijoli gentia, because we all, a lot of us read frijoles. Yeah. And we're all, and we're, we are, as you can see from this display of humanity, passion, radical spirit, and power, we are capable peoples. I had frijoles in preparation for tonight. <laughs> I did. In a pupusa. <laughs> okay, pupusa de queso. I mean, the, the, the frijoles, okay. Nice. That's a good thing. I don't believe we got through the whole event and this is the first time that food has been brought up. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> but um, man, Miriam and Roberto, 
Gracias so much for stopping by and talking to us and schooling us. And Miriam, por favor, maestra, come to City Lights. Let's have a Miriam Gerba event soon. Thank you. Por favor. It'd be amazing to have, host, host you here. It really would. I would love to. And, thank you. Man, for sure. And Roberto Maestro, thank you so much, man, for this book, this history lesson, this lesson on our cultura. Um, it means so much, man. It really does. I, I've been gushing you about it, but I, I won't gush now, but it's essential, man. It's essential. And um, also, Roberto, man, gracias for always acknowledging the store, too, man, and the impact and the legacies. It's, it's, it's beautiful to hear that. Cause, and actually, I'm, uh, I'm transmitting from Lawrence Ferlinghetti's office right now, <laughs> just, to, just, to, just to get you a little a quick view of the place. But um, yeah, man, it, 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 it's, it's real touching that you uh, acknowledge that, Roberto, for sure. No, I, I have a great love. I never stole from you. That's how much I love you. I, that, that, that says a lot, man. That says yeah. a lot. Hey, and we're getting all kinds of, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, Roberto, but we're getting all kinds of folks buying the book over the phone, and they're asking for you to come by the store and sign it. I'm happy to do that. So y'all hear that, mi gente? All 112 of you out there in the Zoom mundo, if you haven't bought this book yet, come to City Lights, purchase it. Roberto Lovato will sign it. Maybe even put a little dirty doodle in there for you. I don't know. Oh, actually, let me, let, me, let me leave it with my parting pen. This is my Ooh. pen. You see this? This is yes. my pen. This is not, this was given to me by a local artist named Josue Rojas, a good friend of mine. Yeah. And it's a pen. It's, it's, it's in the form of an N50 because he understands my approach to writing is that this pen kills fascists. Yes. And that's what we have to do right now is culturally kill fascists. Yes. And I send you all my love and, and heart. And thank you, Miriam, for joining me. And thank you, Josiah and City Lights. And thank you to the, to the audience. Gracias to the audience. Y'all give it up. The audience, give it up for Roberto and Mira Gurba. Give them some love and jazz hands and all that. And uh, please come to City Lights. Buy the book. Come see us. Come visit us. We miss you mucho. And uh, keep your eyes on the uh, City Lights Live event calendars going on. The, uh, coming up on Sunday the 13th, we got the uh, poetry uh, anthology Resistencia, Poems of Protest and Revolution. Tune in for that for sure. So once again, y'all, Roberto, Miriam, muchas gracias. And uh, I hope to see you soon in real time, Roberto. We got we to figure out those signages like ASAP because I don't want... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got, we got, I got we some got people. I got people jamming me up about it, so yeah, I gotta deal with that All quick. Right. Yeah, and I, I'll leave you. I'll leave you with some parting uh, thoughts, mi gente. What it says up on the walls of City Life books. What Roberto writes in his writing, Printer's Inc. is the greatest explosives, y'all. Aquí estamos y no los vamos. All right, thank Al you. Rato.